Hey guys, so this video is on the evolution of early atomic theory. Um, we're going to talk about some of the um, early experiments that led to our current understanding of the atom. So what's in an atom and how do we know it? And we're going to start out with J.J. Thompson and cathode rays. So J.J. Um, Thompson used a cathode ray tube and basically it's what, well there's a picture of an actual one, but in this schematic you get a better idea of how it works. Um, he attached a battery, a high voltage battery, um, to these two, two basically metal plates right here. Um, he applied a, a negative charge to one and a positive to the other. The anode has a positive, the cathode has a negative. Um, and this piece of metal right here, he tried various pieces of metal and he ended up, it's important that he ended up getting the same result no matter what metal he used. And what he found was that when he turned on this voltage, the first thing is that um, he would see spots over here. He had um, um, a material in, inside of this. This is a glass tube here um, that has a vacuum in it. There's no air or anything in it. Um, he had something coating the inside of this that would glow um, when he turned this on. He, he could see that there were particles um, being um, pulled off of this piece of metal and hitting the inside of this, this glass bulb right there. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things he noticed. Here in the middle, he has two things. First, he has two electrically charged plates, one with a positive charge, one with a negative charge. And when he turned the, those plates on, applied the charge to those plates, he found that the particles that were emitted from um, this end over here would be attracted up towards the positive plate and away from the negative plate, so they would be deflected up, up here somewhere. Um, that told him that these particles had negative electric charges because um, opposites attract and likes repel. We, we use this idea a lot. It's basically um, Coulomb's law. Um, and it, so because um, if these have negative charges, they would be repelled by this negative plate and attracted to this positive plate. And that's what happened. Um, the other thing he was able to do was he, he um, put a, a magnet, a north pole and a south pole here, an electromagnet here. When he turned this on here, he, he noticed also that the, the particles would be um, deflected. By measuring the angle of deflection and the strength of the magnetic field, it ends up what Thompson was able to calculate, and this is the importance of his experiment, was the charge to mass ratio of these particles. They ended up being called electrons, and electrons have negative charges, and the ratio of the charge, that's the E, to the mass, that's the M, was this number right here. You don't have to memorize this number. It's negative 1.759 times 10 to the eighth. This C stands for the unit of electric charge, or coulombs, and G is grams, coulomb per gram. Um, that's not an exact number. So um, that's that was really important. Um, now, ideally, we would like to know the charge and the mass individually. And so that's where we come to Millikan's oil drop experiment. Um, Millikan in Chicago, um, did this experiment. Um, this, I believe, down here is a picture of his actual apparatus. Um, this is a schematic. And what he did was he took an atomizer. This is this looks like an old-fashioned perfume sprayer. Um, he would spray some oil droplets into this chamber. And he had two metal plates here that he could elect electrically charge. He put a positive charge on the top one and negative on the bottom one. A um, little hole in this top plate. Um, he had a, a light in here. I don't think this shows it, but there was a light that would reflect off the drops so he could see them with this um, um, telescopic eyepiece that he was using. And so he, what he would do is he would time how long it took these droplets to fall a certain distance. Um, first, with, without the electrically charged plates being turned on, it was just gravity call, causing them to fall. Then he would turn on the plates. Um, and at the same time, he would have this X-ray um, um, aimed at these, these drops. So what the X-ray does, guys, when it hits the air, there's air inside of the air, hits the nitrogen and oxygen atoms, it, not, it ionizes the air molecules, um, knocks one or more electrons off of those that then attach themselves to the, ele to the oil drops. And so now these oil drops have a negative charge, one or more negative charges, depending upon how many electrons get attached to them. And then by um, adjusting the strength of this electric field, this, the charge on the electric plates, um, because these oil droplets now, some of them would have negative charges, and there's a negative charge down here, 
the negative charge on the bottom, the bottom plate would repel that and they would slow down and he could actually cause them to float, even start going back up the other way. And by knowing the strength of the electric field, how fast they, they fell, he was able to calculate the charge on these drops. And he got, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of pieces of data, um, all by hand, all looking through this um, eyepiece right here, writing it down by hand. And so this is an example um, of the data he might have gotten. So on one drop, this charge, another drop, this charge, and so on. And what he was looking for was the smallest electric charge um, because he knew that electrons couldn't be divided up. They had, you know, it, either it was there or it wasn't. And so that means that the smallest electric charge that he found um, likely was the charge on a single electron, which is what he was trying to find. And, and it worked. It ended up that he found that the charge on an electron, well, he didn't get this precision. I think he got like 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th, about like that, coulombs. Um, but what we're going to use, because we now we know it a lot better, as the charge on an electron is 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, not unit of electric charge. Now, combining that with the result of Thomson's experiment, where Thomson found the, um, the, the um, charge to mass ratio, he was able to easily calculate the mass of an electron. So knowing the, the charge, mass to charge ratio, just took the charge on an electron divided by the charge to mass ratio, and he got the mass of an electron, uh, 9.109 you know, to 4 sig figs, times 10 to the minus 28 grams, or 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms. Um, so that's kind of an important number. And that's what Milliken did, a pretty, pretty important experiment. Um, so we're going to um, look at this a little bit. Um, because we know that electrons are fundamental particles, that they cannot be um, um, broken down into anything farther and still be an electron, that, that's, that um, we can do something like this. So let's say we know the total charge on an oil drop is 9.453 times 10 to the minus 18th coulombs. How many negative charges, how many electrons does that drop hold? Well, all we have to do is take the total charge divide by the charge per electron, and we get the answer. And this, guys, this is important. This has to be an integer. So when you do calculation, um, this type of calculation, you're going to get some, some numbers past the decimal place. Um, but we know it has to be an integer. So regardless of sig figs, this, because we know the chemistry, um, we round to an integer. So it ends up, in this case, I think 59 electrons. All right. Um, another thing we can do is look at sort of um, get the idea of what, what um, Milliken was doing, how he did his calculations. So to do this, we'll do this imaginary experiment where, let's say, a chemist on another planet um, does this same experiment, um, but on this planet, instead of coulombs, they use cool mats uh, for the um, basic unit of electric charge. Um, and, you know, let's say he gets this data. He finds that in terms of cool mats, the charges on the drops were these four numbers. Okay. Um, we can use this to calculate the charge of the electron in cool mats. So the way you do this is you look for the smallest of these numbers. Remember, 10 to the minus 18th is a smaller number than 10 to the minus 17th, and 4.22 is smaller than 6.33. So what you do is you take that smallest number, smallest unit of charge, and divide it into the others. If it goes evenly, then at least from this data into all of them, it goes evenly into all of them then we can say from this data that that is the charge of an electron, likely. But let's look at this. If we start doing the division, we take this number divided by the smallest number. You know, we get four. Okay, so there's four. What that tells us is that there's four electrons on this oil drop for every one electron in this drop. And this other drop, this next drop here, 1.266 times 10 to the minus 17th cool mass. Um, divided by the, the smallest charge, we get three, it's an integer. And so that tells us there are three electrons on this drop for every one on this one. But when we do this last drop, okay, oil drop, 6.330 times 10 to the minus 18th cool mass divided by 4.220 times 10 to the minus 18th, we don't get an integer, we get 1.5. So you guys, what that tells us is that there are one and a half electrons on this top drop per every one on the bottom. Well, you know you can't have an electron, so what you do is you find the smallest whole number ratio, which you get by multiplying by 2 over 2. 
And that tells us that there are three electrons on the top drop for every two on the bottom. So from this data, what we would do is we take this charge here and divide it by two electrons to get the smallest unit of electric charge from this data. So in this, from this data, with these units, the, we would say that the charge on an electron would be 2.110 times 10 to the minus 18th cool mass per electron. Now, I just made those units up. These are not real units, but hopefully that illustrates the idea. All right, so now let's look at Rutherford. So at this point, we knew about electrons. Um, and there are all kinds of theories floating around, guys, about what an, what an atom looks like. And the most popular one, because it was the simplest one, was called the plum pudding model. Um, so if you imagine, I don't know, say a, a bowl of jello with some raisins in it, that's kind of the picture that they had. Um, um, the idea being that the jello would be the positive charge, it's kind of in, a, in, a, in an atom, smeared out everywhere. Um, and the, electro, the electrons would be the raisins. They knew there was positive charge because they know, knew there were electrons. We talked about Thompson, Milliken. Um, and most ordinary objects do not have an overall negative charge. That means the only way that can be is if there are negative charges, there have to also be positive charges to balance out, to cancel the negative charges. So they knew there, were, there was some positive charge in there, um, but they didn't know like how, where it was located or, or where it was. So the simplest model said that it was just smeared out kind of like an ether over the whole atom. Um, that would be like jello, or the, I guess the pudding in the plum pudding model. And the electrons would be the, the plums, or the, the raisins in the jello. Um, and this guy Rutherford um, was trying to prove that that was true. And so he did this um, metal foil experiment. Um, usually it's called gold, gold foil, but he actually didn't start with gold. He did it with different metals. And basically he took a really, really thin sheet of metal, put it inside of this ring. This ring was coated with a substance that would... Um, show a mark whenever um, an alpha particle, um, which was shot from this source right here, hit it. And so an alpha particle, what they knew about alpha particles was that they were much heavier than electrons and that they had some sort of positive charge. So if the plum pudding model were correct, okay, what should happen is when this beam of um, alpha particles hit this metal, it should go straight through and which is we should see all the particles hitting directly behind that piece of metal foil um, with very little if any deflection and for the most part that's actually what he saw but he did they did see the people that were doing this experiment along with Rutherford found that there were some deflections some fairly large deflections like almost straight back some of them and that just didn't make sense and they, they kept doing it and doing it and they kept finding the same thing Eventually, they, they came to the only logical conclusion was, and that was, the plum pudding model was wrong. So um, what this led to was the nuclear picture of the atom. This is, uh, Rutherford came up with this, and what he said was, it looks like this picture over here, that most of the mass and all the positive charge is located in this very, very small region in the middle of the atom called the nucleus. And all the negative charge, which was on these electrons that they already knew about, was outside of the nucleus. And that fit this, his experiment da experimental data really well. Because these alpha particles, which would be on the order of a nucleus, of the, uh, of the size of a nucleus, rather, would go through, and most of the time they'd miss the nucleus because the nucleus is so small, so they just go straight through. But if it came close to a nucleus, it would be deflected because like charges repel, the positive charges repel and we'd see a deflection. If it hit a nucleus, it'd bounce back. Um, and that explained their data very well. Well, so um, that's Rutherford's um, metal foil experiment, gold foil experiment. And at this point, the picture is of an atom, and we're gonna build on this, is that the nucleus is in the middle, and one or more positive charges there. All the positive charges located in this really small region. Most of the mass, almost all of the mass, except for the electrons. The electrons are in this relatively large region of space around the nucleus, and that's where all the negative charge is located. 